Welcome back to the channel, Geo here, and it wouldn't be a week in geekdom without me reviewing an Aquaman book. You see, Aquaman is my favorite DC Comics character and one of my all-time favorite heroes. I made a video for the first hardcover. If you want to check that out, I will leave uh, the link at the end of this review. And yeah, let's let's do this thing. Amnesty is the second volume of her ongoing Aquaman run. Of course, this was uh, post rebirth because we're no longer using that title and the first thing that i want to talk about is they eliminated i don't know if you can see it they eliminated the volume number from the standard size hardcovers and you can find them now here at the back right there it says right here it says volume two which is pretty interesting. And the, obviously the uh, thing being uh, a new fan will pick this off from a shelf and not have to worry, oh, where's volume one, where's volume three? They can just pick this and start reading. I don't know if that works 100% of the time, but uh, that is going to be the norm, I guess, because all the books are coming out like that. Uh, so yeah, it, the spine does look cool without the volume number. It looks like a solid uh, reading piece that you're going to get and this story is of course written by Kelly Sue DeConnick who started uh, after uh, Dan Abnett left and this time around Victor Bogdanovic which I probably butchered that I'm so sorry and uh, Robson Rocha and Daniel Enriquez those two are back but uh, Victor's new to the Aquaman title and I didn't really notice a huge departure in style from Robson I think they match and they complement each other art wise pretty damn well so when we left uh, volume one uh, Arthur had lost his memories uh, I'm not going to go over every single detail, but from, uh, from right at the top of my head, uh, Arthur had lost all his memories. He was an amnesiac living in this small island with wholesome folk, and he was going by Andy. At the end of the volume, he starts regaining all, the, all of that stuff back, and you realize that the villagers were actual ancient uh, sea deities who were stranded there due to mythological hijinks. You can read that volume to figure things out. So here at the start of Amnesty, volume two, Arthur wants to regain his memories and he is put into this, I would, I want to assume, death trance, if you will, where he goes into the great beyond, in this case, undersea, and you meet a brand new character called Mother Shark. And something really trivial, which has no impact whatsoever for this review, but I wanted to include it anyways, uh, since I first heard of Mother Shark and I saw the drawings and stuff, the first thing I kept thinking of was Mother Love, the Queen song. And for some reason, the melody, the haunting melody of that song just kept playing in my head as I was reading the comic, and it sort of complemented the story in a really weird way. So Mother Shark, she is, and I was just going to say Mother Love, Mother Shark, she uh, is sort of like the Crypt Keeper, I guess, for all the souls that are passing onward, but it's something beautiful in that it's under sea, because Earth you know, as a whole, it's a water planet, you know, there's so much ocean out there, and it makes sense, you know, for it to be uh, the source of many things, and one of them being sort of like this gate onto the afterlife. I thought that was a pretty cool take on the whole thing, and Arthur uh, talking with Mother Shark, and you get sort of this really nice introspective look at... Arthur Curry and Kelly Sue DeConnick is able to write that stuff in a not cliched way. It's very, it's a very fun way the way she handles it with her uh, mother shark talking about fragments of like these bubbles of uh, memories. And she's very poetic and vague about Arthur's history, not only as an individual and as a uh, uh, Justice League member, but as a hero that is uh, Arthur Curry. The way she talks about him and the way they reflect on his life and his deeds and stuff, was, I thought was pretty well done. 
hitting all the major notes of this character with his uh, how he grew up and all that stuff. So afterwards, without spoiling too much, let's just say that if I take the slipcover off this book right here, real real time, uh, it's not going to be too much of a spoiler. But as you can see from this image, uh, all the sea uh, deities uh, hop on board with Arthur and they leave the island and head towards Amnesty Bay in uh, Maine. And uh, from there, the story kicks off uh, with some really cool character work. I love what Kelly Sue has done with the title. She's taking all the good bits of story from Arthur's past and just twisting it in new ways and giving us new storylines to geek out over. And I love that she's not going for the standard procedure of Here's Arthur against humans because they're Atlantean versus uh, Homo sapiens and they hate each other. Or here's uh, Ocean Master wanting to invade. Or hey, here's Black Manta doing his thing. Instead, he is being a bridge as he's always been between the sea and the land and introducing all these new characters to North America in a very fun way and focusing more on how can you rebuild your life and start anew but still rekindle friendships and all that stuff and i think she has a really good grasp of uh, what makes arthur tick and his connection to the world and his importance as a hero i really do like what kelly sue's doing with the character and i love the run so far i know i'm a little ways behind because i'm not reading it as it's coming out but i do know some things that happen beyond this volume so uh, i am aware of the uh, big bellied issue i would say if i were to point out any negatives actually would be the freaking cover because you see black manta here and i love manta he's one of my favorite villains but he's not i don't think he's needed at this point he appears uh late into the book setting up the third hardcover which will be the confrontation between these two characters these longtime rivals but and i get it a lot of fans of the character want to see that stuff but as someone that likes to keep reading new and different things, I found that it bogged the story and the whole book a little bit for me. It bogged it down somewhat because it's an old, it's an old trope resurfacing. It's like, okay, you made a really cool first volume uh, doing a, an amnesia story. Arthur gaining his memories, an introspective look, analyzing his relationship with Atlantis, Mira, all that stuff, that's great. Introducing a whole bunch of new supporting characters for his book, and then you return to your old ways with uh, Arthur against Manta. We kind of know, regardless of what run it is, we know the outcome, eventually, of these two characters fighting and their motivation, so it's very cyclical in nature. And while that's fun and really kick-ass, trust me, I, I'm not saying I hate it or anything, I just want to see new things like for example in the book we go back to atlantis and we see mira and she is having to deal with her uh royalty thingamajig issues that they are telling her hey you have to be married we need a king uh, to accompany you and all that stuff you got to make this you got to follow tradition and whatnot and she's very much a rebel and she's doing things her way and that stuff to me is really exciting and it gives you an, a really cool look at atlantis Whereas uh, you've never seen that in the past. It's always been very Arthur focused and his uh, reign as king has always been in and out because he's always, you know, second guessing and spending more time on with the Justice League than with Atlantis. So I've, I've always liked when Aquaman writers take the time to develop Atlantis as a whole, as a society. Because, yeah, Peter David did that excellently back in the 90s, but since then it's kind of been okay and kind of you know i wish we would have gotten more in the previous runs but with kelly and the stuff that she's doing i'm liking it she's fleshing out and and ideas that for example uh amnet introduced with his run when uh the rebirth stuff uh kicked in and she's fleshing all that stuff out while still introducing little elements here and there and tons of surprises for her run 
uh, with the Black Manta stuff, like I just said, it, it feels cyclical. And the setup and, and the whole reveal with the weapon that he's going to be using, spoilers, uh, it's cool as hell, but at the same time, I'm like, uh, okay, let's go back to Amnesty Bay. I want to find out about the new characters, the uh, seafaring gods, and I want to find out about uh, Arthur's ongoing relation with Mira and how that develops and whether uh, Atlantis will accept uh, Arthur again and all that stuff. That's what I want to read. Of course, when you imbue the book with action and, you know, uh, seafaring adventures and stuff, it, it makes it even greater. And we do get that. We get a Aqualad, but I'm not going to reveal who because I want you to read it. And his reintroduction to this book is wonderful. Of course, it is beautifully accentuated by the wonderful artwork. It looks gorgeous. And like I said at the beginning of the video, the art really... Uh, I knew who was drawing what, but if you, uh, you, know, if you put both art side by side, Robson and, and Victor, they really do flow in a similar matter. Of course, um, it borderlines between realistic and kind of cartoony-ish. And I guess maybe it's because we had uh, Jonathan Glapion on some of the issues doing the, uh, the artwork uh, with them, the uh, colors and stuff. I think it really accentuates the story and gives it a very yeah, unique, hyperly realistic detail, but still preserves that comic book uh, animated feel that we all love, right? Or at least that's the perfect balance that I look for when I read comics. I want sort of a mishmash of the two elements clashing together and creating unique character works. As for the book itself, uh, there's not a whole lot. I think it's only like five issues, which is, uh, you know, I'll take uh, whatever they give me, I guess. Some of the extras include uh, pencil work and inks and stuff, and that just looks amazing. I, this is my... This is one of my favorite pages. That looks so cool. And it gives you such a eerie sense of escapism that you're not, like it's on Earth, but it doesn't feel like your typical setting in an Aquaman book, even though it's on an island. Also, one of the cool elements about this book is that they reintroduce sort of the Lovecraftian-esque horror, which is absent in a lot of Aquaman material, and I think works perfectly for the character, because he is a seafaring hero, and I want to see sort of this horror action take on Aquaman, with him dealing with characters that are not your typical supervillains. So I really enjoyed that. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, uh, overall, this uh, just uh, solidified the run for me, and I cannot wait to pick up Volume 3 whenever that pops up. Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I think Kelly Sue DeConnick is on a roll, and she's doing great things with the title, and she is uh, worthy of, it, to me, in the pantheon of Aquaman writers. I think she's doing a really cool job. And the art is really dramatic and beautiful to behold. Have you read Aquaman Volume 2 Amnesty from uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick? Let me know in the comment section down below. If not, let me know what is your favorite Lovecraftian tale in comics. Let me know down below. Thank you everybody for tuning in. As always, thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing, being a part of A Week in Geekdom. Thank you so very much. Of course, hit the little bell icon so you know when new videos pop up. And uh, follow me on social media if you can. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. I've got to go. I've got more stuff to read, play, review, watch. It's a madhouse. I will catch all of you on our next video.